Thank you all for tuning in today uh, for our eighth signature event of our 36th season. Our featured guest today is the Honorable Ron Klain, Assistant to the President and White House Chief of Staff. So Ron, before I uh, go through some questions, I want to uh, try to go through your incredible resume. It's disappointing for me to do it because it's so much more impressive than any resume I could ever have put together. It's an incredible, perfect resume for the job you have. So for those who don't know Ron's background, it's quite amazing. He grew up in Indianapolis and he went to Georgetown because he was interested in politics and government and thought that would be a good thing to do, go there. He graduated summa cum laude. He then went to Harvard Law School, was first in his class the first year, which is uh, not easy to do. And he was a member of the Harvard Law Review and graduated from Harvard Law School magna cum laude, which is not easy to do either. He was an editor of the Harvard Law Review uh, during that period of time and also got a clerkship with Justice Byron White. He's also served in a number of government positions and has avoided the temptation to go into long-term private equity. So he's actually served his country for many, many years. And among those positions are chief counsel for the Senate Judiciary Committee under then chairman Joe Biden, associate counsel for judici judicial selection under President Clinton, chief of staff and counselor to the attorney general, Janet Reno, staff director of the Senate Democratic Leadership Committee under leader Tom Daschle, and chief of staff to Vice President Al Gore. In addition, uh, he also served as assistant to the president and chief of staff to Vice President Biden in the Obama administration and returned after serving several years in that position to serve as the White House Ebola response coordinator. Uh, in the private sector, he has worked at O'Melveny and Myers and has served as Vice President and General Counsel to Revolution LLC, which is a Washington-based investment firm led by Steve Case. So, very impressive resume. I think you've got the perfect resume for this job, but my question is, you know so much about being chief of staff to people and you know so much about the White House. Don't you know that being chief of staff to the White House uh, president of the United States is a difficult job to do? And usually the tenure is about 18 months. So when you were offered the job, did you say, I know I'm only going to be able to do this for about 18 months? Or do you say, I'm going to make it all four or eight years? Well, uh, David, thanks. Thanks for that very generous introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, look, I uh, was honored and flattered and humbled when President Biden, President-elect Biden asked me to come do this. Um, it is a grueling job. There's no question about it. I think it's easy to understand why the average tenure in the job is 17, 18 months. Um, you know, I'm here every day working away. I'm honored to be part of this team. I have, I'm very lucky. I have probably the most experienced a group of colleagues who've ever served at a senior level in the White House. I have people who carry a lot of the load every day that makes the job a lot easier than it would be. Uh, we're facing a lot of hard challenges, no question about it. Difficult situations on the international front, a lot of challenges here at home, uh, but I'm really lucky to be part of, a, of an A-plus team that's tackling these challenges every day. So when you became White House Chief of Staff, and I, obviously you'd worked for uh, uh, Joe Biden as uh, when he was a senator and he was vice president, but did you call a White House Chiefs of Staff or do they call you up and say, here's what you should not do or here's what you should do? Do the White House Chiefs of Staff ever get together and give advice to someone like you? You know, it's funny, uh, starting about 12, 15 years ago, they started a tradition when there's a new White House Chief of Staff, all the former Chiefs of Staff get together and uh, meet and give that person advice. Uh, in my case, this happened in December. Uh, it was virtual, unfortunately, because of COVID. Uh, but we had, I think, uh, something like 30 of the 33 former chiefs of staff together on a Zoom uh, to give advice. And each of them gave very thoughtful, very helpful advice. Uh, I think the, the funniest piece of advice, uh, Dick Cheney was gracious enough to join the call. Uh, he had been chief of staff under President Ford. And he just said, I have one piece of advice for you. Watch out for the vice president, uh, which I thought was great advice coming from him. In fact, actually... Uh, I have a great relationship with Vice President Harris. Uh, her office is next to mine in the West Wing, and uh, we meet uh, virtually every day on something or another. Uh, but uh, but uh, Vice President Cheney uh, had that advice for me. You know, uh, I, I've worked for 10 prior White House Chiefs of Staff, uh, and I, one of the ways I try to do this job is take something from each of them uh, in almost everything I do. So uh, we'll talk about the job of being chief of staff in a moment, but I think everybody's really interested in the State of the Union address, that which was given last night. So for those who may not be familiar with it, how much time goes into preparing the text? And is it written over like a month period of time? And then because of 
Ukraine and Russia. Did you have to rewrite it over the last few days? And how difficult was to kind of update the speech as events were going forward in Russia and Ukraine? Well, David, you know, as a former policy staffer here at the White House, that the State of the Union isn't just a speech. It's a kind of a policy document that reflects the administration's agenda. And so the policy work that went into the State of the Union really started uh, late in December and continued with the work of our policy councils in January, uh, kind of developing a lot of the new proposals you heard last night. So that policy work uh, really has been going on for a long time. Uh, sometime in early February, that policy work started to get merged into a draft, into a draft speech, uh, uh, a, a written uh, summary basically of all the policies you heard the president announce. And so we've been working on that draft for about a month uh, since early uh, February. Uh, and uh, Mike Donilon here, the president's senior advisor, uh, led the work on preparing the draft with a lot of input from other people, of course. Um, obviously, we knew early in February that Ukraine and the situation in Ukraine was going to be part of the speech, but that obviously emerged in a much more substantial form and a much more substantial part of the speech uh, once the Russians invaded. So there was some rewriting over the past couple of weeks, uh, building out the Ukraine section, moving it to the front of the speech. Uh, but a lot of that, uh, a lot of what you heard last night really has been months in development uh, to get into the State of the Union. I think um, uh, people who've been in government know that uh, cabinet agencies submit proposals, cabinet secretaries submit ideas, everyone has their ideas. It's a, a very elaborate process to put together uh, that speech that you heard last night. So typically a president will prepare by going through the on a teleprompter the speech several times, I assume. President Biden did that. Yeah, uh, pr the president, uh, as long as I've known him, uh, likes to write a speech by reading a speech. He likes to read a paragraph out loud, uh, think about what he does or doesn't like about the paragraph, uh, edit it, try it again until uh, it fits. And so uh, starting a couple weeks ago, we started that process with him where he'd read parts of the speech aloud, uh, rewrite parts, uh, you know, revise parts, reorganize the speech a bit. Uh, that goes on all the way till the day of the speech itself. So. What you heard last night was the product of um, months of policy work, weeks of drafting, and uh, a lot of intense involvement by the president himself in, in picking out exactly what he wanted to say, how he wanted to say it, and the order in which he wanted to present it. In recent years, uh, we've seen Democratic presidents get standing ovations when they say something from Democratic members of Congress, and Republican presidents get standing ovations from Republican um, you know, members of Congress, but you usually don't see both Democrats and Republicans giving standing ovations to a president. Um, you got a fair number of them when he talked about Russia and Ukraine. Were you surprised that that was a pretty bipartisan response? I wasn't surprised. I think we've seen generally a pretty united country, a pretty bipartisan reaction to Russian aggression and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I think we've been uh, fortunate to have the kind of support we've had uh, on Capitol Hill from both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, you've even heard Republicans who've been critical of President Biden in the past, like Secretary Gates, come out and be very positive about what the administration's done. Uh, I'm proud of our work here. The president spent the past several months working with our allies uh, in Europe, uh, members of NATO, members of the EU on the economic side, other countries like the UK, Canada, Japan, Australia, others, uh, to try to put together this alliance, uh, this uh, unified alliance to confront Russian aggression. And I think that alliance has come together, I think beyond almost anyone's expectations for its cohesion, for its unity, for its effectiveness. And I think you've seen the same thing at home. We were careful all along to try to brief both Democrats and Republicans about the steps we've been putting together, about the steps we've been taking. We've been uh, transparent about uh, the intelligence we received, about what we thought the Russians were going to do, what in fact they ultimately did do. And I think that work with both Democrats and Republicans here at home, with a wide array of countries overseas has created a lot of unity behind uh, the response we're part of with our allies uh, in facing down Russian aggression. Let's talk about intelligence for a moment. Um, usually uh, the intelligence that comes into the CIA uh, is not declassified and given to reporters in a public way. Clearly in this process, somebody, I assume the President of the United States thought it was a good idea to declassify the, the satellite photos and to declassify the information we have about what Putin was thinking or saying. So was that a difficult decision to come to? And do you think it worked or didn't work yet? 
David, I think it was uh, the right decision, uh, given the kind of environment we were facing. Uh, we knew that President Putin had a reputation for disinformation. Uh, we've certainly seen that all around the world. And we knew that his most likely approach here would be to create some kind of uh, disinformation campaign, a false flag attack potentially, a false provocation, out and out lies to justify uh, his invasion of Ukraine. As it became clearer and clearer to us that that was what he had planned, we thought it was more and more important to strip him of that advantage by making clear what we knew his plans were and making it clear to the world what we thought would happen. And I think that decision by President Biden in conjunction with our NATO allies, our other allies that are part of the coalition, a shared decision to proceed this way has been one of the reasons why there has been such a unified and uniform world reaction to what President Putin has done. There's no ambiguity about who is the aggressor here. There's no belief in any of the false stories about what quote unquote provoked uh, this invasion. I think that transparency, that uh, sophisticated use of intelligence in a modern information warfare context has served uh, the allies very, very well. I also think it stripped President Putin of any element of surprise in the attack and helped the Ukrainians be ready uh, for what, what has hit them. So uh, I think what we've done has been uh, well coordinated with our allies, and I think very effective in countering some of uh, Putin's uh, uh, tactics, some of the tactics to use uh, in Crimea, some of the tactics he's used previously. So how do you respond to the critics that you have, and you have some critics sometimes, I'm sure you know, who say yes. you should have sent armaments to the uh, Ukrainians before the invasion, so they were better armed than they are now, though we're now sending them uh, after the invasion, and, and that you should have imposed the sanctions before the uh, invasion occurred. What do you respond, how do you respond to those kind of criticisms? Well, first of all, we did send armaments to the Ukrainians before the invasion. Uh, we sent more arms, more military assistance to Ukraine uh, in the past uh, 12 months than any year uh, since 2014. So uh, we did send a, a variety of kinds of military assistance to the Ukrainians. That assistance continues uh, to, be, uh, to come into the country, but we did send uh, plenty before uh, this happened. In terms of the sanctions, uh, we thought that the best way to uh, make sure we'd have the most unified and powerful set of sanctions was to make it clear that those sanctions would take effect when and if uh, President Putin invaded uh, Russia. And I think the results that we've seen uh, illustrate that, David. You've seen there, there's never been a effort to impose sanctions this stringent on a country as large and as complex and as interconnected to the world economy as Russia. It's really a, a kind of an astonishing effort that you're seeing underway here. And the impact of those sanctions uh, has been devastating. We've seen the Russian ruble fall to uh, 110 rubles to the one US dollar. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, many, many uh, serious Russian banks in danger of collapse. We've seen the uh, Russian stock market uh, plummet in value and now being closed for the longest time since the Russian uh, threatened Russian default uh, more than two decades ago. So the impact of these sanctions have been devastating. They're devastating because they're such a, a powerful group of countries uh, unified in their application. And I think uh, doing it the way we did is what's made all that possible. Okay, um, for sanctions, I'm, I, I don't know the answer to this question. This isn't a question where I know the answer, so I'm actually trying to find out what you actually think about this, how this works. When you impose sanctions, uh, let's suppose the offending party, let's say Russia says, okay, we made a mistake, we're sorry, we're pulling back. Did the sanctions go away or are there penalties that are subsequent to the uh, withdrawal? In other words, are there ongoing penalties or are there in effect reparations for having done these bad things or did the sanction just go away or is that not decided yet? Hasn't been decided yet what would happen if uh, the Russians withdrew. Uh, again, that'd be part of whatever kind of diplomacy would unwind uh, the crisis in Ukraine. Uh, sadly, uh, this, is a, this, as you say, is a hypothetical question. We see no signs, unfortunately, that the Russians have any intention of withdrawing right now. And indeed, their military operations in Ukraine continue to escalate. They continue to um, you know, at, uh, attack more civilians, uh, more civilian sites. Uh, the fighting continues to get more and more fierce. So we offered President Putin a number of diplomatic off-ramps in the run-up to this invasion. We offered him a number of different arrangements, a number of different possible ways in which he could meet with uh, members of the coalition and the Ukrainians 
a number of different uh, kinds of structures to do that. Uh, at every juncture, President Putin rejected the path of diplomacy, uh, continued on the path uh, of invasion, and that's what we're seeing unfold right now. So at the moment, uh, you would say that this could go on for weeks at this kind of pace. In other words, uh, Crimea is already controlled by the Russians, but Kiev is not, or uh, other large cities are not controlled by the Russians. But you think this could go on this way, this kind of slow process for another couple of weeks before there's a resolution, or you don't know when the resolution might occur? Well, what we know is that President Putin uh, has uh, enormous military force and intends to bring that force uh, to bear wrongly on Ukraine. We also know that the Ukrainians are fighting with fierce uh, determination, with powerful resistance, with courage, with bravery, with determination. Uh, and uh, we've seen on TV the pictures of uh, Ukrainians, civilians, uh, standing in front of Russian tanks and stopping them, blocking their access to Russian cities. So we stand with the people of Ukraine. We are providing them assistance of all sorts. We're going to continue to provide them assistance uh, of all sorts as they mount this heroic resistance to uh, this uh, unjustified, unprovoked invasion. Now, the president last night uh, wasn't quite clear whether he was saying we have a lot more sanctions to possibly impose beyond what we've already done. Are there possibly more sanctions coming or it's just we've kind of done everything we can do sanction wise? Well, obviously, we're always looking for additional ways we can apply pressure and uh, and punish uh, the Russian regime for what they're doing. Uh, but I would say our major focus right now is on enforcing those sanctions. Uh, President announced last night in the State of the Union and the Attorney General uh, formally announced today uh, the creation of a new task force at the Justice Department to uh, uh, freeze and seize assets of Russian oligarchs who have benefited from uh, Putin's actions to try to uh, punish them for their ill-gotten gains from the Putin regime. So we're going to continue to work on steps we can take to make these sanctions effective. Uh, if there are other things we can do, we'll certainly look at them. But um, as uh, we, we said at the start, we were going to start high and stay high. Uh, we have launched this devastating set of sanctions, and uh, making those sanctions effective uh, really is our principal focus. Final question about Ukraine for the moment is, uh, President Putin said that his he was putting his nuclear forces on alert. It wasn't quite clear what that meant. But what about our nuclear forces? Are we putting them on alert to kind of watch out for what the Russian forces are doing? It wasn't clear if he was talking about tactical nuclear weapons or uh, intercontinental ones, but are our nuclear forces ready to go if necessary? Or are they any more alert than they were a week or two ago? No, David, we have seen nothing in the Russian nuclear posture that would require us to change the alert status of our forces. Okay, that sounds like uh, no change for the time being. No change. Okay, so let's talk about an area you know fairly well also, which is Supreme Court nominations. Um, you've been on the uh, Judiciary Committee when there had some Supreme Court nominations. Uh, who was confirmed to the Supreme Court when you were working in the Judiciary? Well, if my first tour duty in the Judiciary Committee, the committee uh, confirmed uh, Justice Scalia, Chief Justice uh, Rehnquist. Uh, then I was back when the committee did Justice Souter, uh, Justice Thomas. And then I worked here at the White House in Judicial Selection when we nominated uh, Justice Ginsburg, uh, Justice Breyer. And then I was back here with President Obama when we did uh, Justice uh, Sotomayor and Justice Kagan. So I, I've seen a number of these things, that's for sure. Now, some of the president's critics have said that he shouldn't have said, I'm going to have a Black woman as my Supreme Court nominee because he was excluding 94% of the population, is what some critics would say. Uh, how do you respond to that? And would it have been better for him to say, I'll get the best qualified person and then pick the same person that he did pick? Well, you know, uh, I think the idea that 94% uh, of the population has been excluded from the Supreme Court, of course, is belied by history. We've had a Supreme Court for 230 years, over 100 Supreme Court justices, and all that time, there's never, ever been a single black woman on the Supreme Court. In fact, there have only been three women, four women total on the Supreme, four women total on the Supreme Court and only two African-Americans total on the Supreme Court in the 200 plus year history of the court. So I don't think there's a question of, uh, of underrepresentation of other people. Uh, the president made a decision when he was running for president to make this uh, pledge uh, that he would uh, be a history maker uh, and put the first black woman on the Supreme Court. It's not that different than the pledge Ronald Reagan made during the 1980 campaign, where he said he would put the first woman on the Supreme Court. And that's what he did with Sandra Day O'Connor 
And of course, not that different than what President Trump said when Justice Ginsburg died and said he'd replace her with a woman justice. So these kinds of pledges are something that's happened in history before. And I think long overdue in this case that after more than two centuries, after 120 some odd justices on the Supreme Court, uh, it was time to finally have one uh, black woman. Well, presidents like to interview justices before they appoint them or nominate them. And there's always a game of how to get these people into the White House so nobody knows who's in the White House of being interviewed by the president. So how did you uh, get three people into the White House and have nobody know that they were in the White House? Well, see, if I tell that, then if we have to do that again later, I'm going okay. to give up right, that secret. That I, think that's a, I think that's a piece of trade craft that I'm going to keep to ourselves here. All right. Can you tell us whether he interviewed more than three people in person? Uh, he interviewed three people. He interviewed three people in person. Uh, and uh, uh, so I'm happy to, to say that. On February 14th, he interviewed uh, three final candidates in person. And when a president of the United States, any president, uh, the ones you worked for before, when they decide to pick somebody other than a person that they interviewed, um, that's in other words, they, they pick somebody, the ones that they don't pick, who can actually calls that person up and says, well, sorry, you didn't get it. Does the chief of staff do that or the president? Uh, in this case, I think, uh, in this case, the White House counsel called uh, the other people who were interviewed and uh, some of the other people who were considered who didn't uh, get presidential interviews, but were considered interviewed by members of the counsel's office. Uh, all these people are incredibly talented people. Uh, some of them are been nominated to other judgeships. Uh, some of them, I'm sure, will be nominated to other judgeships in the future. President was fortunate to look at a list that included just an outstanding group of people uh, and uh, ultimately was proud to pick and nominate uh, Judge Jackson. So the people that get nominated for the Supreme Court or considered for it are obviously very articulate people. They have great resumes. They are really, really smart. But do you find in your experience they get tongue tied when they get into the Oval Office and they're meeting with the president? Or do they, they're, they're as articulate as they always are, or are they not tongue tied? Look, I think everyone's nervous when you're interviewing for a big job, and this is one of the biggest of all jobs, and you know, it's a, it's a high pressured interview. But I think everyone, certainly that President Biden talked to, did an amazing, remarkable job, were incredibly impressive. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm sure they all felt uh, some anxiety, some nervousness about it. How could you not? Uh, but they, uh, they all did a really, really, uh, really, really remarkable job. You know, back in 1993, uh, when we were working on uh, President Clinton's first uh, nomination, uh, he came down to a number of candidates. One of them was Justice Breyer, who he didn't nominate that time, nominated a year later. But uh, he was supposed to come down to the White House for his interview with President uh, Clinton. And the day before he was supposed to come down, he was riding his bicycle in Harvard Square, got hit by a car, punctured a lung, uh, and uh, couldn't come down to the White House. So we flew up to Boston, and, and a bunch of us interviewed him in his hospital uh, bed. Uh, and, uh, you know, finished all the vetting reviews we had to do. And they had to come to Washington to see the President Clinton the next day. But be because of his punctured lung, he couldn't fly. So we had to take the train with a broken rib, with a punctured lung, all the way from Boston down to Washington. By the time he got there, of course, everyone knew he was on the train. It was hard to keep that a secret. Uh, and he was mobbed at Union Station. So, uh, you know, I think all these interviews are different. They all have great stories uh, this time. Uh, in the end, it was Justice Jacks, Judge Jackson who really impressed the president as the right person uh, for this vacancy. Okay, well, um, it takes 51 votes to be confirmed. You've got 50 Democratic senators and you have the vice president of the United States. Uh, do you think you can get any Republican votes for your nominee? Well, I hope we will. When Judge Jackson was uh, up for the Court of Appeals uh, last year, uh, she got three Republicans to vote for her confirmation. Uh, when she was nominated to the district court under President uh, Obama, she got a, a broad bipartisan vote. Uh, she got nominated to the U.S. Sentencing Commission, got a broad bipartisan vote. So uh, I hope she will have bipartisan support. She deserves bipartisan support. Like Justice Breyer, uh, Judge Jackson is a consensus builder. She's someone who's got respect from both Democrats and Republicans since she's been nominated among the people who've endorsed her confirmation. Uh, our former retired Judge Thomas Griffith, who was the a general counsel at Brigham Young University and named by President Bush to the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. A former judge, uh, Ludig, uh, who was a senior official in the Bush Justice Department, uh, one of the nation's leading conservative legal figures, a judge on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, who's endorsed her confirmation. 
Fraternal Order of Police has backed her confirmation. So I think she has broad bipartisan support out in the country, and I hope that will translate to bipartisan support in the Senate. One of the Democratic senators has had a health problem and I think is not in Washington right now. Do you have any reason to believe that he will not be back to vote for this nominee? No, Senator Lujan actually is in Washington. I think he's being treated at uh, Walter Reed. Um, uh, and I fully expect he'll be back in time to vote on Judge Jackson's confirmation. And let me ask you a clarification on how the process works. You would know from your days as a Senate Judiciary Committee uh, staff director, if you have 10 Democratic senators on the Judiciary Committee and 10 Republican senators, and you don't get any Republican senators to support the nominee, you don't get out of the committee technically, so you have a discharge position, a, a petition, but on a discharge petition, is that subject to filibuster that would require you to get 60 votes? So uh, uh, the, the specific answer to your question is no, but let me walk that back a bit. The Judiciary Committee has a tradition of reporting out Supreme Court nominees, even if a majority of the committee does not support the nominee's confirmation. When uh, now President Biden was chairman of the Judiciary Committee, the committee reported Judge Bork's nomination to the Senate floor on a six to nine negative vote, but made the decision that the nomination should proceed to the Senate floor. Clarence Thomas, again, had a tie vote in committee uh, and nonetheless was recommended out uh, by the Judiciary Committee to the Senate floor. So first of all, I'd hope we wouldn't get to a place where you had that kind of uh, deadlock in the committee. I hope the committee would honor that tradition and send Judge Jackson's name onto the Senate floor. Of course, I hope mostly some Republicans on the committee would vote for her so she'd have a clean majority. Even if not, I hope the committee would report her out. Finally, if the committee did deadlock, as you say, there is a discharge motion that just requires 50 votes uh, in the Senate uh, to, uh, to proceed. Uh, again, I, I don't think there's any reason why we should get to any of that. Judge Jackson deserves a strong bipartisan vote in the committee, on the floor, and ultimately on our way to confirmation. And you hope to get this confirmation done by what period of time? Well, uh, Senator uh, Durbin, the chairman of the committee, announced today that uh, the hearings on Judge Jackson would begin on March 21st uh, and go uh, through most of that week. Uh, hopefully, uh, at the end of that week, the committee will set a timeline for a committee vote and then on to the Senate floor. Uh, I think the nomination is moving along on an appropriate timeline, a timeline kind of similar to what happened with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, six to seven weeks from nomination to confirmation. But uh, I'll leave that in the hands of uh, Senator Durbin, Senator Grassley, Senate leadership to, to hit the right schedule. All right, let's talk about Build Back Better. Um, I wondered who came up with that tongue twister? Um, it's hard to say that quickly. Um, was that something that you came up with or who came up with that? I don't know who came up with it. Certainly was the principal slogan for the president's campaign. Uh, in uh, 2020 uh, was uh, uh, the slogan for most of his policies, was the umbrella under which most of the policies uh, that he ran on, Build Back Better. Uh, it's actually gained some traction around the world. Uh, a number of European countries have now adopted Build Back Better initiatives. So I think it's a slogan that's uh, resonated with people. Uh, it is a bit of a tongue twister, but I think it does have some resonance and it comes from the campaign. Okay, so is the Build Back Better bill that passed the House likely to ever see the light of day in the Senate? Or are you now committed to breaking it up and passing individual pieces of it? Well, I think what we're going to try to do is get as many of the president's initiatives enacted as possible in the best way possible. Uh, the Senate has the option to do reconciliation as a procedural device that takes only 50 votes to pass uh, a bill that has tax changes and other kinds of economic changes in it. Uh, and that would probably be the vehicle we'd use uh, to move some legislation like this through the Senate. Uh, we're obviously in conversations with a number of senators about what elements have the most support, what elements uh, are uh, the most effective to get passed in the Senate. You heard the president talk about a number of those last night, David. I think people are very concerned about inflation and very concerned about what inflation means to everyday families. And that means uh, they pay too much for things. And so uh, key parts of uh, the Build Back Better plan uh, address that directly. Bring down the cost of child care, bring down the cost of prescription drugs, bring down the cost of elder care, bring down the cost of health care. Uh, so we're looking for, and, of, and most importantly in some ways, or equally importantly, I should say, bring down the cost of energy by moving us to more of a clean energy economy. So uh, you look at those proposals, there are proposals that meet the moment 
of higher costs. And we're going to continue to work with the Senate to find a formula that moves that agenda forward. Okay. Um, speaking of inflation, the Federal Reserve is supposed to be uh, in charge of dealing with interest rates and things like that, as they are. Mm -hmm. And they have telegraphed that they're probably going to do something soon, but they don't actually say in advance exactly what they're going to do. But you've proposed a number of nominees to put on the Federal Reserve, and one of them has attracted some controversy, former Secretary, uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense, um, uh, Raskin, uh, and, and um, Sarah, uh, Sarah Raskin. Um, and is she is she going to be tied to the uh, nominations of the others, or are you going to separate her out so that Jay Powell could be confirmed? Presumably, he would be. Well, we'd like to see all five of these nominations move together. We think it's a balanced slate. It's a bipartisan slate. It includes Republican and Democrats. It includes people from a number of backgrounds. All of the five nominees by the president have been endorsed by the Community Bankers Association. They have widespread support uh, from labor and business from a variety of uh, people across the board. Uh, and so we think the best thing to do would be to fully staff the Fed. Uh, uh, Sarah Raskin, as you say, uh, not only was the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, uh, she was the Chief Banking Regulator in uh, Maryland. Uh, she was formerly a Fed governor herself. It's hard to think of anyone more qualified for service on the Fed to be the uh, Vice Chair for Supervision, uh, Sarah Raskin. So we want her to get a vote. We want all five of these incredibly distinguished and accomplished individuals uh, to get a vote. Uh, and I know that's what Chairman Brown, the chairman of the banking committee is uh, moving towards and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get it together. Look, it's, it's great for people to give speeches to say they care about inflation, inflation's a problem. If you do, uh, step one is to have a fully staffed, fully functioning board of governors at the Federal Reserve. And uh, I don't expect every Senator to vote for our nominees, but they should at least cooperate and allow the nominees to get a vote, to get a committee vote, uh, and then to move out of committee onto the floor. So, Ron, uh, you have uh, been criticized by some for saying that uh, you are so powerful that you really are effectively running the whole government. How do you respond to that? You're like, you're the prime minister. It's ridiculous. Uh, I'm a staff person. I've been a staff person my whole life. I've never run for anything. I've never been elected to anything. I've been proud to work for some distinguished public servants. Uh, President Biden being one of them at several points in time in my career, uh, President Obama, of course, President Clinton. Uh, uh, that's, that's who I am. And at the White House, uh, not only am I a staff person, uh, I'm a staff person who works with a number of other enormously talented staff people. We have, uh, with all due respect to the great uh, job you did at the Domestic Policy Council, we have a great Domestic Policy Council team here uh, in the Obama White House, led by Ambassador Susan Rice. We have an incredible national security team led by Jake Sullivan. We have an incredible economic team led by Brian Deese. Uh, we have uh, senior advisors around the president like Cedric Richmond uh, and uh, Mike Donnell and Steve Reschetti, um, uh, Jen Psaki, Kate Bedingfield. So uh, this is a real team effort here, team on the policy side, team on the strategy side. Uh, my job is just to help coordinate those people, get that advice to the president. Uh, so uh, so that, that's how I see my role. How do you respond to the other criticisms that some people have had, not necessarily of you, but of the president, that he governed as he, he campaigned as a moderate, but he's governing more to the left than people expected? And what is your response to that uh, criticism that some have made? Yeah, look, I think that that criticism uh, wipes out the history of the 2020 campaign. Uh, there's nothing that the president sent to Capitol Hill that he did not put before the voters in the 2020 campaign. Our economic agenda is the economic agenda he ran on and 81 million Americans voted for when they elected him. In fact, if anything, we've trimmed that agenda back. Uh, the Build Back Better plan that we sent to Capitol Hill was significantly smaller than even the one we campaigned on. Uh, the infrastructure bill is something he campaigned on. Uh, the voting rights bill is something he campaigned on. And the COVID relief package that we started the administration with, again, is something he endorsed in the campaign. So he was very straightforward with voters about what he would do if he were president, and that's what he's done. And look, it, 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 the, the, the proposals we put forward are substantial. Why? Because the problems we inherited were substantial. It's not any vision and not any grandiose vision. We inherited an economy that was dead in the water, uh, 50,000 jobs a month, just 50,000 jobs a month the three months before we got here, virtually dead economy. Uh, the government hadn't even bought enough vaccinations to give one vaccine to every American, let alone two vaccines to every American, let alone booster shots. 
Uh, we had no system to really massively distribute and administer those vaccines. Uh, we face a climate crisis. Uh, we face all kinds of other challenges. Now, obviously, this challenge over in Europe. So we've put together proposals to meet the moment, not out of some uh, effort to kind of do something bigger than we should, but because we inherited very big problems. Uh, and, and you've seen a lot of progress. We obviously then went and created more jobs in one year than any administration in history, or any administration since 1939, according to a New York Times fact check. So any administration since 1939. We uh, see the fastest economic growth in 40 years. Uh, was the first time in 20 years our economy grew faster in a year than China's economy. So we put in place the kind of recovery measures that were needed. We vaccinated over 220, fully vaccinated over 220 million Americans. Uh, you know, th these are big tasks we took on this year, and I'm proud of what we've done to achieve them. Why do you think uh, so many Americans don't want to be vaccinated? Is, is this something you have largely accepted as a fact that you're not going to be able to vaccinate everybody? Well, I think 75% uh, of adults are fully vaccinated, and half of those who are eligible have also been boosted. Uh, vaccine resistance is part of American history. It goes all the way back to George Washington having to uh, require his troops to get the smallpox vaccine when they didn't want to get it uh, on the verge uh, in the Revolutionary War. Uh, those of uh, those people who lived through the polio vaccinations in the 1950s know that it took uh, eight years to get the country as vaccinated for polio as we've gotten it vaccinated for COVID in a single year. So uh, hesitancy about new vaccines is kind of an American tradition. It's a global uh, thing. We're seeing it in Europe as well. They've had a little more penetration. They still have substantial vaccine hesitancy in some countries in Europe and other countries around the world. Uh, we're gonna continue to make the vaccine accessible, available, and free. We get people vaccinated every day. You know, that's the thing. We've been a, more than a year into giving out the vaccine and still every day, hundreds, literally hundreds of thousands of people still show up for that first shot. And so we're gonna keep at it and keep at it and continue to make progress. Now, the White House has gone uh, mask-free as I understand it now. Does that mean that you'll be having more people come into the White House? It's easier to deal with uh, visitors now? Yeah, we're gonna start to, over the next few weeks, uh, have more uh, people coming into the White House, uh, mostly for business and then ultimately for more social events too. Uh, we're looking to resume uh, sometime next month, uh, public tours of the White House. Uh, so we're going to start to see things get back to normal here. Uh, it's going to take a while to spin all these systems back up, but we're looking forward to having more of the public back in the people's house. So uh, usually in the, after the first year of an administration, uh, you see some turnover in a cabinet or something, but you haven't had any turnover and haven't had any scandals either. So uh, how come you haven't had any scandals and how come you haven't had any turnover? Well, uh, I think the president did a very good job of picking a cabinet and picking senior officials. And I think the lack of scandals reflects that. Uh, I think the lack of turnover reflects the fact that uh, these are men and women uh, who are very eager to serve, uh, who are doing a great job, who are making a difference. Uh, it's the most diverse cabinet in history. It's the first time in history the cabinet's been evenly divided between men and women, the first time in history that a majority of the cabinet uh, isn't white. And uh, it's a diverse cabinet. It's an incredibly talented cabinet. And we're very lucky to have their service. So as you know from history, uh, the first midterm election after a president is elected is generally not a time where a president picks up House seats. Yeah. Um, in fact, I think the tradition is you lose about 30 House seats, something like that. Um, so if that were to happen and you lost control of the House, would it not be difficult to get your legislation through? Or do you think you can overcome the history pattern that I just uh, mentioned? Well, um, I'm here in a federal building, so I'm going to try not to, I'm not only going to try, I'm not going to violate the Hatch Act. I'm not going to engage in electioneering here on federal grounds. What I will say is, uh, I do believe we're going to hang on to the House and the Senate, uh, but probably there should be another time and place where I go into okay. our plan to do that. Well, just speaking, one final election question. The president has said he plans to run for re-election. Uh, any change in that? You expect he will run for re-election? I do expect to run for re-election, yes. OK, um, so let's talk about the job of being chief of staff and how the White House works. So the president, does he get up early in the morning and call you at home and say what's going on? Or or do you you get in? What, what time does he get in and what time do you meet with the staff people and what time do you see him in the beginning and the end of the day? How does that work? So uh, I'm usually in the White House every day by 645. 
Uh, and uh, I talked to the president early in the morning by phone from the residents. Uh, we have our morning staff meetings before the president comes downstairs. We have a, a number of different kinds of alignments of meetings, depending on the day of the week and whatnot, um, where we kind of go over what's going to happen that day, what's going to, what the key questions are that need to be put to the president. Uh, what are the key things we need to resolve that day as a team? Uh, as I said, this is a, uh, I've worked in the White House many times before, um, but I think this is the most team-oriented staff uh, I've seen. It's a group of people, um, some newer, some older, uh, in terms of their service for the president, but people who uh, know each other, have a good camaraderie, close working relationships, a lot of veterans of prior Democratic administrations, um, and uh, a lot of people who uh, you know kind of know each other well and can work together very well. Uh, we have our meetings in the morning. Uh, usually the president comes downstairs uh, around nine o'clock. Uh, I'm uh, his first meeting of the day every day. I kind of go through where things are and some key priorities, get his uh, reaction to the materials he's been reading overnight. The president takes with him upstairs every evening a thick binder of materials to read, uh, decision memos um, and briefing memos. Those, he usually comes in with questions. Uh, I try to come in with answers uh, and uh, we have a conversation. Then he's proceeds to a number of different staff meetings. I see him a number of times during the day for different kinds of meetings that are going on, whether they're national security meetings or domestic policy meetings. Uh, and then usually uh, at the end of the day, I come in and kind of uh, wrap with him on, uh, you know, what are the key outstanding things? What are the things he's going to see in his book that night that he really needs to focus on? Uh, and what are the big uh, decisions he's going to have to make in some of the meetings he's going to have the next day? So some presidents like to work in the Oval Office. Uh, some of them like to work in the residence, and some of them like to work in a little private study off of the Oval Office. So what does President Biden like to do? Most of his work is in the Oval Office. He does uh, use the private study uh, off the Oval Office uh, for lunchtime meetings because uh, he's got a little table there. He can have lunch. Uh, but most of the day he's in the Oval. And uh, today, um, does anybody have the right or the senior staff who has walk-in privileges? Are you the only one that can walk into the Oval Office without an announcement or are there a couple of people that can do that? No, any of the president's senior advisors, senior policy advisors can come in and see him. Obviously, you know, it's, he's got to not be in another meeting or whatever, but, but uh, I, I, we run a White House here where a lot of people have access to the president and a lot of people are able to talk to him straight and directly about what they think uh, without having to go through me. So um, the president seems like an even tempered person, but you know, everybody gets upset from time to time. Does he yell and scream or he's not a yeller and screamer? How does he show his displeasure at something? You write a note to him or, he, or to you, or how does he show, say he's not happy? I think one of Joe Biden's great strengths as president is that he has lived a life filled with incredible triumphs and incredible tragedies. And um, people know his biography, they know his background, uh, they know the successes he's had. They know the grave personal setbacks he's suffered. And one thing that is true is there's never a morning I go in there with news that's as bad or worse than the news someone else has had to deliver to him at other points in time in his life. And I think that gives him a very even keel. I think when things are going well, he doesn't get too uh, hyped up. And when, when we're having tougher days, uh, he maintains that composure, that demeanor. And uh, I think that's one of the hallmarks of his temperament. Uh, one of the things he brings to the office, that that uh, steadiness, that experience, uh, and, uh, and a life uh, that has been, as I say, filled with triumph and tragedy, uh, and that's uh, seasoned him and prepared him for this moment. Some people say he's, you know, it's 79 years old. That's old to be president of the United States. Do you see signs of his age? Uh, is he uh, in better shape than you are in terms of exercising or how do you uh, deal with the fact that he's, you know, older than anybody's ever been to be president of the United States? Well, he's a, he's definitely in better shape than I am. That's for sure. He's very fit. He works out almost every day in the morning before he uh, comes down to the Oval Office. Uh, and I think the American people saw for themselves last night, the president stand to give an hour long address uh, that was filled with passion and power and uh, wisdom and energy. Uh, they saw him hold the longest press conference in the history of presidents uh, a couple weeks ago at the start of the year, a two hour press conference where he took questions from all kinds of reporters. So I think his fitness, his vigor uh, is beyond question. Uh, people see him on the job every day. Uh, and then what they see is a person who's fully capable of doing the job, fully vigorous and great 
mental and physical health uh, and taking on the burdens of the office and executing them well. So uh, today, uh, you would say the president enjoying the job, or does he say, geez, I wish I hadn't really done this? Well, I don't know that enjoying is the way you describe tackling the responsibilities of being the president of the United States, and particularly now, where I think he has emerged as the leader of the free world, as the person who's leading this coalition that's confronting Vladimir Putin. But I think he's very glad he ran for president. I think he has uh, you know, been well prepared for the challenges he's tackling. I think more importantly, I hear from people all around the country, Democrats and Republicans, that they're very glad he's the person in the Oval Office right now, that he's the person with the background, the experience, the judgment to tackle these hard problems. And uh, so I, I think there's a lot of confidence in him uh, as the person who should be where he is. Okay. Now, you were the chief of staff for two people who served as vice president of the United States. And as I know from working in the White House, the vice president of the United States is always trying to make sure the president remembers that they're around and they're giving, giving important assignments. So how do you take what you learned as chief of staff for Al Gore and Joe Biden and make certain that your vice president is deeply involved in what's going on? And how do you respond to the criticisms that some have made of her that she hasn't been as effective as some people thought she should be? Well, I think Vice President Harris is doing an amazing job. I think she got off to one of the fastest starts in this job. She's taking on important responsibilities on the economic agenda, on the national security agenda. Most recently, she was in Munich with a lot of our key allies uh, the weekend uh, that uh, the invasion of uh, Ukraine uh, got underway. Uh, she uh, is on the phone almost every day with some of our European allies uh, managing this uh, crisis that we're facing. And that's just on the international side, on the domestic side. She's played a key role in assembling and putting together and advocating our legislation. Uh, as you say, I work for two vice presidents. And what I learned from that is how valuable the vice president can be in assisting a president in achieving his agenda. Uh, the, the she, she, in this case, she is the only other person who's been elected by all the voters. She's the only other person who is an elected official in the White House. Uh, the only other person who has, uh, unlike the cabinet members, no specific responsibility, but the ability to coordinate between different cabinet departments. I saw that with Al Gore. I saw that with Joe Biden. We see that with Kamala Harris, and she's doing a great job at the job. So um, the president's favorability ratings are not as high as I assume you would like. And uh, I wondered, how do you in the White House deal with that? I mean, it's hard to, to, to deal with it overnight and just say, you know, people should like me more and so forth. But how do you try to deal with the fact that his unfavorability ratings are higher than, um, let's say, he would prefer, I assume? So is that something you think will turn around or you just accept the fact that people don't like presidents of the United States that much anymore and they're always going to be unfavorable in terms of their ratings? Well, I think the most important thing is for the president to do the right thing. And uh, I think that what you're seeing right now is um, a mood in the country that's impacted by the fact that this pandemic has lasted longer than anyone thought it would. Uh, that while we've had tremendous growth on uh, the economy and jobs, we're having a problem with inflation. And I think those things contribute to um, a generally um, uh, a mood in the country that's not as upbeat or confident as we would like. Uh, we're not the only democracy facing this. Uh, you've got uh, elected leaders all around the Western world uh, with low approval numbers. Uh, and uh, I think they're facing a lot of the same challenges we're facing here in the US. What I think in the case of President Biden is, we made a lot of hard decisions in 2021 to put in place a new economic strategy that you heard the president talk about last night in the State of the Union, a new COVID strategy that we're again uh, updating again today with new steps on COVID. Uh, and those hard decisions, I think, are starting to show results. Uh, I fully accept the fact that the American people uh, are more show me, not tell me. And what they want to see is they want to see that we really have reached a new way of managing COVID. They want to see we really have not just created jobs, but the jobs are going to stay. The wages are going to go up. They want to see that these the rec economic recovery is real and sustained. I think the political credit will follow from that. Uh, when I was here, both with President Clinton and President Obama, we saw the recovery ahead of the politics. And I think you're seeing that now, too. Right. And so I do think our approval rating will go up in the months ahead uh, as the economic recovery and the progress on COVID uh, become more permanent, more lasting, and internalized more by the voters. 
So uh, with uh, masks uh, being taken off a bit and more socializing, do you expect to go to more cocktail parties in Washington where people will say, well, Ron, I have a good idea for you, or I don't want to really tell you how to do your job, but let me tell you what you should do. Do you get a lot of that now by emails or you get people from high school calling you up with ideas? Or how does that work? I do get a lot of emails uh, from old friends uh, from home in Indiana and from old friends in Washington. I think one of the one of the consequences of uh, having been around as long as I have is I have a lot of uh, people I've worked with and they all uh, have my email and they all uh, send emails. And it's great. I get a lot of great advice that way. Um, get a lot of great input that way. I'm grateful for uh, most of it. Um, I'm, I'm not much of a cocktail party person. I never have been. And the hours are pretty long here. And so I think I'll probably still be a lot of emails uh, and phone calls uh, as it has been. So how do you stay in shape when you have to work these long hours? I mean, you can't go spend uh, two hours at the gym during the day, I assume. So how do you stay in shape and, uh, you know, stay healthy? <laughs> I wish I was in better shape. I'm not very good at that. I wasn't very good at that, frankly, even before I was this busy. Uh, try to watch how many French fries I order from the White House mess. I guess that's the best thing I can do. Uh, but uh, I wish I was in better shape. I guess that's, you the, don't, that's the most. You don't seem shape. to have a lot of gray hair compared to, you know, <laughs> what I would have expected. How do you uh, deal with that? You have good genes or something? I think just good genes on a full head of hair and dark hair. So uh, I guess I'm grateful, grateful for that. Now, one of my former uh, partners at, uh, at Carlisle was Jim Baker, and he was considered uh, maybe up until you the gold standard of how to be chief of staff, but he didn't actually like the job that much. And he wound up as Secretary of Treasury eventually and as Secretary of State. So do you have any aspirations to any of those jobs or something like that? I don't think so. I think uh, when I finish my tenure here, I'll go back. Uh, I'll, when I finish my tenure here, I'm going to like take a month and sleep and then I'll figure out what I'll do next. Uh, you know, Secretary Baker, I got to know him a little bit during the Florida recount. When we were on opposite sides of that. He was leading the effort, of course, for then Governor Bush. I was uh, our general counsel for uh, uh, Vice President Gore. And got to know him a little bit in that uh, during that 33 days down in Florida. Uh, he has been unbelievably gracious. He sent me the the kindest note when I got this job. Um, he sent me a couple other notes since then. Uh, he's just such a uh, you know he's just been he's just such a wonderful person. Um, and um, uh, and I, he is the gold standard of doing this job. Uh, I couldn't even aspire to that. Uh, I just try to do the best I can every day. So if you look back on your tenure as chief of staff. Is there something that you think you could have done better or the president could have done better? And people might often cite Afghanistan. Any second thoughts about Afghanistan or anything else you wish you had done better or differently? Look, I think there's something uh, every day I think about that I should have done differently. I'm not going to uh, speak for the president. I think the president's done an unbelievable job here. Uh, I try to do my job as well as I can, try to do it better every day, try to learn from what we've done. Uh, I'm proud of what we've done. Uh, proud of uh, how we've done it. Uh, I'm sure we can always do better on things. Um, but, um, you know, I think the thing I really focus on um, is just trying to get as much advice as we can, uh, trying to listen to as many people as possible. Uh, you mentioned our cabinet before. We have an unbelievably talented cabinet. I think it's got more state and local officials, uh, former state and local officials, mayors, governors, uh, than any recent cabinet. They bring an incredible perspective to the thing. We have subject matter experts in the cabinet. Um, I try very hard to get advice from them. Uh, they bring their own perspectives to it. Uh, so to me, it's about listening and learning and trying to just get better at it every day. So whenever you do finish this position as uh, chief of staff uh, and a friend calls you subsequently and says, I've been offered the job of chief of staff to the president of the United States, would you tell him to take or her to take that job or not? I would definitely tell anyone to take this job. It is a hard job. But it's a unique opportunity to work with, first of all, an incredible president and vice president, of course, at a time that's very important to our country, and to work with an amazingly talented group of people here in the White House, throughout the agencies. Uh, they just blow me away every day, and I learn something new every day. Uh, it's been uh, the culminating experience of my career, uh, and um, I, um, I just couldn't be more grateful for the experience. And uh, whoever replaces me in this job, whenever my time in the job ends, uh, I hope uh, has, has the same kind of experience. A final question, Ron. Um, when uh, you do have some downtime at all, and maybe you're not exercising, do you have any hobbies or anything you do just to get away from it all, or you cannot get away from it all when you have this job? I think it's very hard to get away from it all when you have this job. It is kind of a seven-day-a-week uh, job. There are things going on all the time. 
uh, whether, uh, you know, Rah uh, Rahm Emanuel famously sit, walked in one day when he was chief of staff and said, Friday, only two more work days till Monday. And, um, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of how it works here at the White House. And not just for me, frankly, but for uh, virtually everyone who works here. Uh, that's, the, that's the burden of working here. It's a great honor. It's a great privilege to work here. Uh, but the work never stops. Um, you know, I, uh, uh, I, I do try to find time every day uh, to call my kids. I have three wonderful adult children living in different parts of the country. Uh, and it's always a pleasure to take a few minutes and catch up with one of them and hear what they're doing. Uh, and, uh, but um, but it, is, it is a seven day a week job. Right. There's no question about it. Your children tell people what you're doing or they don't want to tell people what their father's <laughs> doing. Uh, you know, I, I help my children live in their own lives, doing their own things, uh, and uh, I'm proud of them, proud as I can be, and uh, um, uh, look forward to spending more time with them uh, when all this is uh, when all this is over. Ron, thank you very much for giving us this much time, and thank you for your service to our country. Well, thanks for having me, David. Appreciate this very much. Thank you. Bye.